Good morning, friends. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How good it is to gather with you together again in worship this week and to trust the presence of Christ in our lives to continue to give us strength, hope, and endurance. As we spoke last week, we talked a bit about the conversation of the people of God centered not just on us having God, but God having us, and that giving to us confidence to be able to be the people God has called us to be. Today, I would invite you to consider another element in that journey, and that is honesty. Recognizing places in which we have become, as Pastor Andy will preach in a little while here, about being stiff-necked people, where sometimes we struggle to be honest and humble. Recognizing that there is a need for us to continue to grow, for us to continue to be the people God has called us to be. As we begin worship together today, I want to draw your attention to a couple of scripture readings that I believe will help shape and form that conversation. The first of which comes from Psalm 106. I'm going to be looking at the first six verses and then jumping over to verses 19 through 23. And I would invite you to get honest with me for a few moments as we share together in this reading. The psalm reading I'll be sharing with you today will be coming from the Common English Bible, Psalm 106, beginning in verse 1. Join me if you would. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord because he is good, because his faithful love endures forever. Who could possibly repeat all of the Lord's mighty acts or publicly recount all his praise? The people who uphold justice, who always do what is right, are truly happy. Remember me, Lord, with the favor you show your people. Visit me with your saving help so I can experience the good things your chosen ones experience. So that I can rejoice in the joy of your nation. So I can praise along with your possession. Lord, we have sinned right along with our ancestors. We've done what is wrong. We've acted wickedly. In fact, we think back on them. It says in verse 19, they made a calf at Horeb, bowing down to a metal idol. They traded their glorious God for an image of a bull that eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, the one who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, awesome deeds at the Reed Sea. So God determined that he would destroy them except for the fact that Moses, his chosen one, stood in the way right in front of him and turned God's destructive anger away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That's a tough one, isn't it? It's a tough one to be able to declare thanks be to God on, but to celebrate the ways in which we intercede on each other's behalf, the ways in which God must deal with the realities of our walking away to get our attention, to draw us to a place of repentance and a place of renewal. And I ask that you and I would consider today the places in which we in our lives have sometimes walked away, not necessarily been honest. In fact, maybe have crafted calves of all sorts, that we might continue to worship something that is not God, but that we might also intercede on each other's behalf, standing in the way that God might be able to pour out God's love upon us as the people of God. We read in Philippians then, in our epistle reading today, some words of specific encouragement. How then, as the people of God who intercede on each other's behalf, might then live in these days? Turn with me, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4, as we look at verses 1 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Loved ones, I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Yes, and I'm also asking you, loyal friend, to help these women who have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the scroll of life. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise— Practice these things. 
Whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Well, gracious Heavenly Father, we take a deep breath today. We recognize that it is not easy to be able to find ourselves coming to a deep place of honesty about the things that have become for us, dare we say, idols. Dare we say preoccupations. Dare we say the things that mold and manipulate our attitude, our perspective. For some of us, it's an issue of fear. We're afraid at where the world seems to be going that we will somehow be lost or that our faith message will be lost. Lord, there is nothing in this world, not any politician, not any political process, not any issue of disease or illness that will somehow dethrone you. You are still God. It doesn't take away the, the seriousness of those issues in our world, doesn't cause us to somehow feel as though we can walk through life just skipping around thinking that everything is just great, but it changes the way in which we face the situations of life. When we are honest before you and we trust you, we recognize the opportunity to live as a people of joy, thinking upon such good things. Oh Lord, help us. Help us to be honest with you today about the things that we have somehow made to be so much more important than you. Help us to be honest with you about the things that we have made more important, especially when those things are not stuff, but people. When we have taken and somehow looked around us and have stopped seeing other humans as human beings, the, the creation of your hand, that which you declared in the Genesis creation narrative as good, but we have somehow declared it to be bad. We ask, O oh God, that you would guide us and direct us today. May we find our new hope in you, renewed strength coming from you, our perspective realigned as we worship together today as your people. And, O oh Lord, in the upcoming days and weeks as we try to find new balance in this particular season, I ask, O oh God, that you would help us to continually keep our eyes on you, that you, O oh God, may be the peace that reigns and rules in our hearts, in our minds, in our beings, and especially in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here looking out on the horizon I can't believe that you would stop and think of me Caught in the wonder and nothing like this Seeing your beauty, oh I just can't take it in In the light of your mercy in the clouds of your glory In your presence I am worthy I am found I am free All of them surround me I hear your voice overwhelm me In your presence I am worthy I am found I am free
surface water I won't go under, I won't drown And when I'm in, over my head I know that you won't let me down And when I'm broken And down to nothing I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. 
They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. Good morning. That video was not to call out football fans. I just want to point that out. There were also images of concerts and other events where we may fall into the temptation of getting completely swept up in the pageantry of it all. That can happen with a Christian artist just as easily as anything else. And I think the reality is, as we look at our passage today, we may find that intentions, although very important, are not always a sure fire safety net when it comes to our being very distracted and getting into that idol worship rather than worshiping God. So let us take a moment this morning and read Exodus 32, 1 through 14. I'll be reading out of the Common English Bible as usual. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what has happened to him. Aaron said to them, All right, take out the gold rings from the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He collected them and tied them up in cloth. Then he made a metal image of a bull calf, and the people declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf. Then Aaron announced, Tomorrow we will have a festival to the Lord. They got up early the next day and offered up entire, entirely burnt offerings and brought a well-being sacrifice. The people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to celebrate. The Lord spoke to Moses, Hurry up and go down. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt are ruining everything. They've already abandoned the path that I commanded. They have made a metal bull calf for themselves. They have bowed down to it and offered sacrifices to it and declared, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I've been watching these people, and I've seen how stubborn they are. Now leave me alone, that my fury burn and devour them. Then I'll make a great nation out of you. But Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, Lord, why does your fury burn against your own people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and amazing force? Why should the Egyptians say he had an evil plan to take the people out and kill them in the mountains and so wipe them off the earth? Calm down your fierce anger. Change your mind about doing terrible things to your own people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you yourself promised, I'll make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And I've promised to give your descendants this whole land to possess for all time. Then the Lord changed his mind about the terrible things he said he would do to his people. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. This passage is so familiar to Christian circles and to Christians and in Christian circles that we often hear people making reference to golden calves, just like the video we just watched. This is a good way to call someone out who may be replacing God with something destructive. What comes to mind when we talk about idol worship really depends on our own personal experiences, our own personal view of the world. I often think about those who are sort of slaves or idolizing particular images or material position, material possessions because in the U.S. we live in the land of plenty, more than plenty. So imagining somebody sort of worshiping at the feet of wealth or fame or something like that, is, it, it easily comes to mind. In another area of the world, one might actually picture or have experiences with people who have created images and created statues that they do call gods. It's a bit more literal for some. But to be very honest, for the sake of transparency, I believe in my own reading of this passage, I often assumed poor intentions and poor choices and don't often think about the ways in which we may all be guilty of this very act. I am not saying that the Hebrews made good choices or had good intentions, but I wonder if a closer look might reveal to us that, uh, that their mistakes here included a desire to do the right thing 
but they went about it in all the wrong ways. So let's begin with their motivations. What was the catalyst for them going to Aaron in the first place? To do what we have to look at that and see, to do that, we have to look at that, look at their approach to Aaron and see what they said and consider what that might mean to us. They begin by pointing out that Moses has been gone for a considerable amount of time. And frankly, they have no idea what has happened to him. They are distressed by his absence and feel the need for leadership. This was their first bad decision, not going to Aaron, but not trusting in the Lord and not trusting in their own history. Talking to Aaron was fine. Forgetting who they were, that was their first mistake. Not only that, when you hear them refer to Moses, they say, that Moses or this man, Moses, which is their way of showing disrespect, distrust, or at the very least that they did not care if something terrible had happened to him. It lessened his status among them. They were concerned not for Moses, but for themselves, obviously. Bad decisions and wrong thinking seems to go hand in hand with that type of thinking. Fatigue, fear, and loss of purpose. These are three of many elements that often lead to poor decision making. When we are tired, fearful, or insecure, when we don't have a place to channel that energy, we may attempt to create a purpose. This was the case here in my opinion. The Hebrew people are coming to Aaron, feeling insecure, fatigued after waiting for Moses for too long, in their opinion. And what's interesting is that they don't ask Aaron to lead them. No, they ask for an idol, an immovable object to lead them. So Aaron agrees, receives the gold that is likely taken from the Egyptians as they were freed from slavery and cast a golden calf. He gives the people what they want. They cried for leadership, decided on their own what they should be, what that should be, regardless of the ways in which God had delivered them, and then they turned to worship that immovable object. Now Aaron, one who is not likely to attribute the Exodus to anyone other than God himself, seeks to combine this object with Yahweh. He built an altar, places it with their new idol, and declares that the next day will be a festival to the Lord. And this is when things get a little bit crazy. The people, having achieved their goal, begin to party. The passage says that they begin to drink and celebrate. What started out as a plea to Aaron, born of fatigue, fear, and insecurity, loss of purpose, has now melted down into an idolatrous party complete with drinking and dancing. They had been set free or set loose. This is the part of the scripture where I am, temp attempt I am very tempted, I should say, to shake my head and act as if I could see this coming from a mile away. And in some ways I can because I know the story. But the question is, have we actually learned from the story? Have I actually learned from this story? We aren't always aware of our weakened condition. Until it is too late, we aren't always cognizant of the ways we are being drawn away from God by our own fatigue, fears, or loss of purpose, loss of direction. We might even think that the efforts we are taking to recover are honorable or even holy. But if we make an, if we make an idol out of our misery or the solution, we have lost sight of God. So are you with me? If we make an idol out of our misery or solution, we are in trouble. Sitting at the feet of any idol, whether it be our challenging circumstances or our victorious solution and worshiping is not what we have been called to do. Even good things like diet, exercise, vitamins, essential oils, and nutrition can be idols. Even good things like Christian artists, Christian writers, or pastors can be idols. Anytime we elevate things above God, we have fallen into the trap of gilding even good things that God has provided into gold and idolizing it rather than worshiping God himself. And we see in this passage that God is not happy about that. God sees what is happening and tells Moses to get back down there and deal with his people. 
This is the equivalent of a mother telling the father to deal with his children when they are acting up, for example. God is so disgusted with the Hebrew people in this moment that he distances himself from them and could it get any worse. He is so frustrated with the stubborn or stiff-necked, as the NIV says, people, that he tells Moses that he will start a brand new nation. God has freed them from generations of slavery, parted the sea, led them to the place where they now have turned from him. He is comparing them to livestock that is that has to be pulled with a rope in the right direction, even if it is on the edge of a cliff. So Moses intercedes. He takes the two-pronged approach as he prays for these stubborn idol worshipers, his people, God's people. He appeals to God's reputation and his covenant with Abraham. This appeal to the history of God's relationship with his people is effective, and Yahweh relents. After repeated instances of the Israelites reacting with insecurity and rebellion to God's marvelous goodness— he once again puts that goodness on display. What I love most about this passage is that God is not some distant, transcendent being. He is relatable. It is a reminder that we are made in his image, a reminder that intercession is effective, a reminder that we are in relationship with God, in fellowship with our creator. In the video that preceded this message, they said, idol worship is, it's not just for golden calves anymore. Only we know what our golden calves may be. Only we know what may lead us into that place of temptation to create for ourselves distraction, a solution to our problems, or anything that may take the place of God. But only God can free us from the consequences of that idol worship. Moses repents on behalf of the Lord's people. We must repent. Moses reminds the Lord of his history and fellowship with his people. We must have fellowship and history with the Lord. The solution cannot be an idol, and it must be the one who created you, frees you, loves you, and seeks to be in relationship with you. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that we have been able to share with you, to consider what the scriptures may have for us, to hold ourselves in the place of, of accountability, to ask ourselves some difficult questions. But Lord, as we repent of the ways in which we have fallen short, we also praise you for your incredible, glorious, and beautiful love that you have for us, the ways in which you put that love on display for us every single day. And Father God, as we proceed in our weeks, allow us to be able to recognize those marvelous moments. And Father God, when we may fall into temptation to try to solve things ourselves, to create idols, Lord, please prompt us, put it on our hearts that we have been led astray. Lord, we seek you. We want to have our hearts seeking after your will. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. Till